Hi, I think a good amount of people have joined so we can get started. Um, my name is Melissa Gans. I'm attending an allergy and immunology at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital. And I will be moderating the first half um, of this webinar today. So I just wanted to remind everyone um, about a few quick housekeeping things. Um, so this welcome, first of all, to the CIS um, January case um, conference webinar. And just a reminder that this webinar is sponsored by the Early Career Immunologist Committee, um, who will be the moderators for this session. Um, for all trainees and attendees, um, trainee membership with the CIS is free, and you can apply by going to the CIS website, www.clinimmsoc.org. Um, the webinar is intended to be very interactive, so please place all comments and questions into the chat box. We will not be using the Q&A function for the session, but use the regular chat. I will be moderating the chat box and filtering the questions to the presenter and to the mentor. Um, the first case presentation that we have here are two patients that are followed both at the University of Miami and at the NIH. We have Matthew White, who is a PGY-1 internal medicine resident at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital, who will be the presenter. And then our, we are very lucky to have our senior mentor today, as Kennedy Rao, who is a senior research physician at the NIH. Um, and with that, Matthew, you can get started. Okay, hey, great. Um, thank you, Dr. Gans, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, Dr. Rao, for being um, senior mentor in this case. And special thanks to Dr. Gans for um, her uh, guidance on making this presentation. So our patient is CS, an African-American female. Um, at two years of old, she presents a local physician with lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and thrombocytopenia. Between two years old to four years old, her platelet comes normalized, but she has persistent lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. At this point in time, lymph node biopsy shows hyper hyperplasia with normal flow studies. Um, infectious workup at this time is negative. At six years old, um, she's admitted to the, to the hospital with severe hemolytic anemia and, and neutropenia. In terms of her family history, she has a mother with chronic lymphadenopathy with no history of cytopenias, um, who's currently pregnant with a girl and no other siblings. Her father is healthy and the family denies co-sanguinity. So in terms of differential diagnosis of further, further workup, um, what would anyone suggest at this point in time? And this, this is the summary. We have a few outs here. Would you like to be specific? Any specific genetic mutations in ALPS? Anything else besides mm -hmm. ALPS? HLH, CTLA-4 deficiency, STAT-3. LRBA we have. What type of workup would you like to do? IMN, I'm not sure what that is, Gita, if you could. Kate says fast, BIK, 3CD, SOX, S1, SYK. Perfect. Great. Okay, so we have a broad differential here. We have a lot of ALPS, APDS. Great. Matthew, you'd like to move on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so our patient is diagnosed with ALPS, um, autoimmune lipoproliferative syndrome. She has a, um, she's found to have heterozygous variants in the coding sequence of a caspase 10 protease, um, resulting in an isoleucine to leucine um, missense. Vari variation at position four or six. Um, her patient's mother is also with this variant, although mildly affected, and the patient is noted to have elevated DNT cells. Um, as shown in the figure on the right um, of this slide, um, I four zero six L variant exists within the large, large subunits of the caspase ten protease domain. Um, three uh, amino acids downstream from the active site that catalyzes proteolysis of downstream targets. To speak a bit about the characteristics of this variant um, that speak to its pathogenicity, in a study led by Dr. Jennifer Puck, um, it was found that there was demonstrated low allelic frequency of this variant within um, the general healthy populations. Um, it was found in two unrelated families with the ALPS phenotype. And it's also been found that I46L impairs apoptosis in co-transfection assay when transfected alone and dominantly inhibits apoptosis mediated by wild-type caspase 10 as well. And in these figures, um, you see a decreased amount of decreased percentage of cell loss with transfection and with transfection with the wild types um, compared to um, no insertion and the, and the wild type as well. 
So just to touch briefly on ALPS, um, it's a rare autosomal dominant condition um, resulting in immune dysregulation due to the inability of the immune system to carry out lymphocyte apoptosis. Um, consequences of it result in lymphoproliferative disease, um, lymph lymphadenopathy, and hepatosplenomegaly. Um, because of the effects in apoptosis of autoreactive lymphocytes, autoimmune cytopenias, and other manifestations exist. And um, because of um, lack of apoptosis of oncogenic lymphocytes, lymphoma can be a, a complication. In terms of laboratory studies, hypogammaglobulinemia, as well as elevated DNT um, cell percentage are characteristics, characteristic amongst other biomarkers. And in terms of genetic defects, approximately two, two, two out of three patients with ALPS have identified genetic defects, with the majority of patients harboring a heterozygous streamline mutation in FAS, characterized as ALPS FAS. Um, sec secondarily, in um, the, the most common, sorry, secondary genetic defects is in somatic mutations in, in FAS. Um, and then in rare cases, um, mutations in FAS ligand as well as Caspase 10, such as our patients, uh, exist. So to just briefly on the diagnosis of ALPS, um, the revised criteria for the 2009 NIH International Workshop um, describes definitive diagnosis and probable diagnosis as a combination of both required criteria and one primary accessory criteria or one secondary accessory criteria respectively. Um, so just to run through the list of criteria really quickly, um, required criteria include chronic lymphadenopathy and elevated DNT cell percentage, um, primary accessory criteria include defective lymphocyte apoptosis on assays, somatic or line pathogenic mutations, and secondary accessory criteria include um, elevated levels of biomarkers, typical immunohistological findings, um, autoimmune cytopenias, and elevated IgG, so, um, and family history of lymphoproliferation with or without autoimmunity. Um, Matthew, I want to stop you for a second. Um, Kennedy, do you have any thoughts on the ALPS criteria? Do you think we could use this? Any exceptions to this? Yeah, I think I, I, I told Matthew specifically to put this slide here to remind everybody that this criteria was designed by us in 20, 2009 is when we met and decided on the criteria and 2010 we published us about 12 years ago. Uh, so this is time to revise this because many patients with many other uh, genetic disorders that uh, came up in the differential diagnosis of this particular patient on the first slide uh, will be called, erroneously called ALPS and I don't want that to happen. So at the most recent ECID meeting, some of us met and then we are still having ongoing conversations about revising the ALPS criteria completely. And we want to only call the ALPS patients with a FAS variant as ALPS and everybody else, we need to give them a different name, maybe lymphadenopathy, lympho lymphoproliferative disorders with genetic defects or whatever. Otherwise, what is happening is a lot of patients are being called ALPS and people are sitting there with a, they think they have a diagnosis, but they really don't have a diagnosis. As you know, in this day and age, on page one, everybody is coming out with gene names today, slide one today, as you saw. So genetic uh, testing and evaluation has become cheaper. It is much, I'm just putting my plug for genetic testing here. It is cheaper to do a genetic testing in Invitae or one of those commercial labs than uh, to do a MRI scan or a CT scan in this day and age. So we should not shy away. We should do genetic testing sooner rather than later because there are specific targeted treatments, as you know, available for many disorders. I'll stop here. Okay, so back to the clinical history of our patients. Um, at 10 years old, um, she is on penicillin, but, but having cytopenias and increased ESR refractory to treatment. At this point in time, she started on Celsept. At 15 years old, she, had a, she has an admission to the pediatric ICU um, due to severe pneumococcal pneumonia um, with bacteremia and requires VATS and a chest tube. At this age as well, she was noted to have hypogammaglobulinemia and poor antibody titers and started on replacement immunoglobulin. At 18 years old, she's experiencing refractory exacerbations of lymphadenopathy on Celsept. And at 19 years old, um, she's experiencing intermittent URIs and pneumonias, bilateral knee polyarthritis, um, chest imaging uh, suggestive of ILD, and also having further refractory exacerbations of lymphadenopathy requiring higher maintenance doses of steroids. So at this point in time, um, our patient also has a younger sister as well, 
um, who's 15 years old currently at this point in time, um, also sharing the CASP-10 I-406L variant. She's had numerous episodes of severe autoimmune hemolytic anemia and immune thrombocytopenia from infancy with chronically low immunoglobulins. She has slow growth rate and short stature, numerous admissions for pneumonia, um, intermittent knee arthritis, and as you can see on the right, right by this imaging, very severe um, ILD um, with significant diminished vital capacity with severe diffusion defects, um, also managed on cell sept IVIG and penicillin. So can you stop here for a minute, uh, Matt, Matthew? Sure. This is this is not, I mean, if any one of you have read any papers that myself and many others have published on ALPS with a FAST defect, it is obvious that this patient does not look anything like FAST patients. Patient with ALPS, ALPS with a FAST genetic defect have a hypergamma globulinemia according to criteria. And this patient has hypogamma globulinemia with significant lung uh, lesions here, as you can see. And at this point, my research nurse actually came to me. Her name is Susan Price. She's retired now, but she's the first author on the natural history paper of ALPS FAS. And she kind of persuaded me that this is not ALPS. We have to look for other reasons. And by then, Dr. Rosenzweig, who is also here, had already set up a panel testing, iron torrent for panel testing. So we did an iron torrent on this patient. And lo and behold, you have the answer after this. Go ahead, keep going. So anyone have any additional thoughts on this? Anyone see this in ALPS patients? Could this be something else? What could it be? Megan says that three. Okay, so Matthew, why don't we go to the next slide? Sure. Adrian says CVID. The patient does meet criteria for CVID with the sinopulmonary infections, hypogam, and poor antibiotics, but... Matthew, you can go on. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, essentially, as as Dr. Rao said, um, the patient does have uh, the clinical characteristics of ALPS, but other or other symptoms are not characteristics of ALPS, um, being severe and recurrent um, infections, hypogammaglobulinemia, um, interstitial lung disease, poor growth and short stature, and um, this polyarthritis as well. So this patient, um, because of this, at this point, based on clinical suspicion, they undergo further genetic testing. And they're diagnosed with STAT3 gain of function disease. <clears throat> and from this slide, you can see that um, all of these characteristics of ALPS overlap with STAT3 gain of function disease. So, to speak a bit about um, STAT3 GOF, it's caused by um, heterozygous gene line gain of function mutations in the STAT3 gene um, and results in a syndrome um, caused by immune dysregulation that is ALPS like in clinical presentation with early onset multi-organ autoimmunity and lymphoproliferation. Um, most predominantly, patients experience autoimmune cytopenias, lymphoproliferation, susceptibility to infections, hypogammaglobulinemia, enteropathy, and growth deficiency. And also, um, uh, less commonly, but um, still existing arthritis, ILD, endocrinopathies, and erythropoiesis defects. Um, this figure on the right, it shows a relationship between age and clinical features of STAT3 gain of function um, and shows that there's an earlier onset um, of lymphoproliferation and autoimmunity, um, an alpha like phenotype, and relatively late onset of, of arthritis and ILD, um, which was um, uh, characteristic of, of what was seen in our patients. So this is just a, a slide showing a, an overview of the STAT3 signaling pathway. Um, and just to go through it really quickly, um, a cytokine um, here, IL-6, binds to the cognate receptor, um, which leads to phosphorylation of, of JAX, um, activated JAX, the phosphorylate STAT3, um, allows it to form dimers, and it's shuttled to the nucleus to act, act as a transcription factor. Um, germline mutations in STAT3 GF um, mutations, um, sorry, germline STAT3 GF mutations, they've been described in all functional domains of the protein, and um, they exhibit their effects on different um, distinct um, areas in this different distinct steps in this um, signaling pathway. So these siblings had um, STAT3 classified pathogenic heterozygous um, P714L variant. Um, in terms of the pathogenicity of this variant, these siblings do not get functional um, validation testing, um, but this variant is found very infrequently in the population um, as well as 
um, that this variant is located um, closely um, to known pathogenic variants um, at the 715 and 716 location. Um, they didn't get functional validation studies, but if we were to do functional validation studies, um, it could be done using STAT3 plasmids with the variants of interest transfected into STAT3 deficient A4 human colon cancer cell lines. So on follow-up, um, last seen age of patient on follow-up was 26. At this point in time, she was on serolimus and IVIG and, uh, and was doing well. She was using prednisolone as needed for cough and joint pain exacerbations. Um, and because she moved away from Florida, she hasn't seen us in about a year. Her younger sister at last follow-up was age 19. Um, she underwent a short-lived treatment with tocilizumab for ILD. Um, her cell sept was discontinued as well, and she continued IVIG. Um, the patient remained well off of cell sept and tocilizumab. So I'll, I'll just ask um, Dr. Rao to comment on um, the CASP-10 variants in these patients. Yeah, so I think we, I wanted to keep it simple and short. We presented about 10 patients with CASP-10 variants, including these two girls uh, at a ASH uh, as a poster in 2016. And then lo and behold, my good friend uh, from uh, Paris, France, uh, Fred Luca and his colleagues published, uh, presented this story at the most recent ECID meeting in October, 2022. So what we have seen, and it has happened since 20, uh, way back in 1999, one of the patients was given a CASP-10 ALPS moniker. So patient was happy he got an explanation, but then we called and told him your CASP-10 is not real because we have seen it in Danish blood donors. So CASP-10 variant is very common in the populations and you can find them in various population groups, including populations in Asia, Africa, India, wherever you look. So it is very important to make sure that caspase 10 is real. And we are now learning that caspase 10 variants, they may cause something in some other disease in some other subspeciality, I don't know. But none of these patients that we have at Paris or at NIH, where I think we, between the two of us, we have the largest collection of caspase 10 variants so far, about 20 patients. None of them we think are really having any disease that is caused by caspase 10. They are also, or we have to look elsewhere. So we have to keep doing extended genetic testing in all these patients and find other explanation for their lymphoproliferation or whatever other comorbidities they have. One of my patients has glomerular nephritis. Go figure that out. So somebody asked a question in the chat. I just was briefly looking, asking about all the biomarkers that we keep talking about, IL-10, soluble fast ligand, vitamin B12. Remember, all those are stunningly uh, remarkably kind of very convenient and easy to look for and they are elevated in only ALPS FAS. You don't see any of those markers in, in any other so-called ALPS, including ALPS U, we say ALPS with undetermined genetic defects, where all these patients were actually kept as a kind of a uh, wastebasket diagnosis, I will say. So it is important to remember that. And I will also say that the so-called fast ligand that we reported from NIH in the 90s, I have never seen another patient with fast ligand defect. And the patient with fast ligand does not behave anything like an ALPS patient. He has already had a liver transplant done recently because he had liver failure, liver dysfunction and hep hepatorenal syndrome. So I think ALPS, when you say it is should be specifically limited to whether germline or somatic FAS, and we should not call any other disease ALPS, if you ask me. That is my sincere, honest opinion about this, and I would like to answer any other questions others may have. Thank you. Um, Kaneda, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the, the slide that Matthew showed earlier that seemed to me pretty con convincing that this variant was pathogenic. Um, yeah, the, 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 the whole problem is if you do apoptosis assays, you will find some defect in the apoptosis assay itself. But if you go back and read our uh, paper from 2010, by then we were already aware and Jennifer Puck herself was part of the uh, committee that came up with the nomenclature that for a ALPS diagnosis, you really don't need an apoptosis defect because the most important group of ALPS patients that don't have an apoptosis defect are the somatic ALPS-FAS patients. 
And so I think this apoptosis assay should be discarded. It should not be used for diagnosing ALPS. That is what we said in 2010, and I re-emphasize it. Because you will find some defect here and there, and you can do some experiments and find. Because this particular patient does not have anything like ALPS as we understand it. So that is what we had to go by the clinical gut feeling that this is nothing but STAT3 gain of function. We have, as you know, the most recent paper in Jackie shows you all the STAT3 gain of function patients behave very similarly to this patient. So I don't think, and uh, the 10 uh, CASP 10 patients that we have, as well as the Paris group has, they all have different clinical phenotypes that does not jive well for calling it a syndrome, you know. So I think Caspase 10 is a red herring and we have to move beyond. If you have done ex exome sequencing or some other panel testing and you see a Caspase 10 variant, my honest opinion is just ignore that and look elsewhere for the explanation of whatever underlying disease you're looking for. Because I get called every uh, few times in a uh, month or a, a few times in a year uh, about this Caspase 10 variant in patient with some uh, neurological disorders, some cardiological problems, so all kinds of places it is com coming up. So it is not really a real uh, disease causing variant. I think it is so prevalent in the community that it keeps popping up everywhere. Um, Matthew, I was wondering if you could go to that slide that describes the natural history um, of SAT3 and Maybe, Kennedy, if you could expand a little bit more about the age of onset of the different features, because if you look on the left, it yeah. seems like everything presents early, looks like ALBS, and then the more distinguishing features are later on. So I think early onset, mostly children will come up with lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, cytopenias. We have seen that in APDS, ALBS, CTLA-4, you name the disease, uh, you will see it. But I think that, that then slowly the other end organ damage kicks in. And I have a, most recently, actually, Josh Milner and I co-managed a patient in Dana Farber in uh, Boston. This is our own patient that has been my patient for the last 20 years. And he's now living in Boston. So his doctor there called us and he has brain lesions. Go figure that out, as you can see. And uh, his oncologist in Dana Farber was insisting on doing a brain biopsy, and we kind of persuaded them not to do it. Uh, and they listened to us and just gave him uh, tocilizumab and uh, the jack stat inhibitor medications, and his brain lesion has resolved. So that is what we are learning a lot more about. I want, you published, you take 10 patients and publish a paper and call it a disease or a syndrome, but then unless you see about 100 patients, your clinical phenotype won't be clear. That is what is the point is later onset of uh, other uh, endocrinopathies particularly seem to be not as common, but when they come, they, they seem to be affecting a lot more patients. But I, I have not managed many of these patients because my kind of interest is limited to lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly and cytopenias, as you all know. Um, and Kennedy, can you talk a little bit about when you would consider BMT in a stat 3 gain of function patient or just in other ALPS patients in general? Yeah, I will not do BMT in any ALPS patient. Let me be very clear. ALPS patient with a fast defect does not deserve a bone marrow transplantation uh, comorbidities. So you can do whatever you want to do because we have not done it. And I, even Jack Bleasing will agree with me today. But uh, all other patients, depending on the end organ damage, you will do a, certainly you will think about bone marrow transplantation. In start three gain of function patients, if they have a, a kind of a significant comorbidity that you are not able to manage by steroid sparing or JAK-STAT inhibitory therapy, then of course you will do a bone marrow transplantation. But I think if you talk about bone marrow transplantation, I will do it. <clears throat> After the diagnosis of malignancy in any patient, like X-Men patient, MAGT1 defect patients, of course, I'll, I will have a very low threshold. Same with APDS patients. If they are surviving limb, after one lymphoma, then before they get the second one, maybe you will consider a bone marrow transplantation if you have a suitable donor. But STAT3 gain of function patients, I don't, I mean, I will, I'll leave it to the people that are transplanting these patients to give opinion rather than me giving uh, ad hoc opinions here, but I don't think they need to be rushed into bone marrow transplantation as uh, in their early 
first or second de decades of life. That's what I will say. What do you think about the role of a JAK inhibitor for the SAT3 gain function patients? Absolutely. We will certainly consider ruxolitinib and tocilizumab both in these patients. But to be very, very, very honest with you, way before we knew anything about SAT3 gain of function, we managed a few of these patients on MMF, including these two girls. Uh, I actually started the MMF on these girls first in the, at NIH when they came. Dr. Dauna Boruko, who is a hematologist in now and she's in Connecticut, I think. She and I co-managed these girls for quite some time in, when they were living in New York. And uh, MMF seems to work okay in most of these patients, to be very honest with you. So we should not throw it away. And sirolimus is another good drug to consider. Uh, uh, most of these patients will do very well on tocilizumab and corticosteroids, but maybe it will be difficult to deal with all the comorbid, I mean, the toxic side effects of that. But some patients tolerate some drugs better than the others. So that is where. So if you are reaching the end of the line and they are not able to take any medication and they're falling apart with bad lungs, I think you will be looking at lung transplant even before you do bone marrow transplant in some of these patients. We have had such bad lungs, lung disease in them. So Matthew, now that I am talking to you, do you have a follow-up CT scan on these girls from what I showed in 2016 in the ASH poster that you showed here? No, I, I don't think we we do. Um, I'll, I'll have to double check that. Yeah, just see if you can find a uh, CT scan of the chest. Uh, that's all I'm asking for both the, both the siblings. And okay. if not, if the do you know who is the immunologist following the older sister in New York? We can reach mm -hmm. out to them. I, I I'm not convinced they're followed by someone. I I don't know the. Okay. Um, yeah, they have been, no, no, yeah, I I hear you. Yeah, we have had the same problem here also. <laughs> if there's anyone you are currently seeing these two patients, let us know. We can share yeah. the records. Anyone yeah, if anyone in the audience knows anyone who is seeing these patients in New York, please let me know. They last followed up about two years ago. And yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. I, well, there's a couple of good questions in the chat. Um, Scott wanted to know why, why stat three gain function patients have short stature? Is it somehow... I don't think that is absolute. That is exactly the problem. People see half a dozen patients and write a deep paper, and then you think that is how you have to find everything in those patients. None of my patients, I have at least half a dozen of them I have seen so far as a, they came to me as ALS patients. None of them have short stature. So this is the problem with these patient papers that we write sometimes. So some of them may have growth hormone defect and autoantibodies to growth hormones, and they may have short stature, but that is not, you don't have to have short stature to call it STAT3 gain of function. That's what I'm coming to. Um, and then last question, do, do you follow cytokine levels um, in your ALPS patients or STAT3 gain of function patients, particularly IL-18? Do you find that helpful? Or yeah, no. you know, we used to do IL-18 vigorously in ALPS fast patients. I don't find it very helpful because it is all over the place. It is not as predictive of a fast gene defect as IL-10 or soluble CD25 or uh, soluble fast ligand, to be honest with you. Okay, Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us today um, to discuss these patients. And Matthew did a fantastic job for very challenging cases for um, internal medicine resident, um, future allergists and immunologists in a few years. And Erica, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Yeah, great case. Um, all right, well, we have another really exciting case coming up. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Rachel Guess here. She's a pediatric rheumatology fellow at Washington University in St. Louis, um, uh, where I am as well, um, a pediatric rheumatology and immunology um, physician. And today we have our senior mentor, uh, Dr. Sergio Rosenzweig, who is our own CIS president and um, director of the uh, immunology service at the NIH to serve as our senior mentor. So let's take it away, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, can you see my slides now? Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Wonderful. Um, I'm honored to be presenting today, and I have an interesting case that I hope we can learn from, and maybe these uh, brilliant minds in the audience can also give us some insight. So um, my case, I'll get right into it. Um, and this is a, a pun on a Greek myth that we'll get into. Um, so for our case, um, 
This uh, fall, we received a 14-year-old male to our rheumatology clinic as a transfer of care from Texas. He had paperwork indicating a diagnosis of seronegative polyarticular JIA, and his uh, medication regimen that he presented to us on was prednisone 10 milligrams daily, methotrexate weekly, rituximab to two months, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and Norco. This is an unusual medication regimen for us to see for that diagnosis. The family uh, told us more history, and it sounds like he presented at a uh, workup for Kawasaki and a final diagnosis of systemic JA and uh, was successfully managed and able to discharge and apparently went into a remission on um, methotrexate the and then was off all medications for uh, several years. Then the family reports that around age nine, he had return of joint pain and a small red periorbital lesion that had a rapid growth. Uh, and imaging was concerning and showed enhancement of the tissue. An initial biopsy was fairly nonspecific. And his paperwork indicated he had been treated with multiple immunosuppressives uh, across, across different classes, including steroids, methotrexate, adalimumab, abatacept, hydroxychloroquine, IVIG, infliximab, rituximab, um, with minimal response to various therapies. So getting into his family history, his mother was completely healthy until age 19, at which point she developed autoimmune disease and was diagnosed with lupus, RA, and Sjogren's. Um, she also had lung disease severe enough to be on home oxygen. And then unfortunately, uh, a year ago, in last February, she passed away from COVID pneumonia uh, at a very young age in her 30s. Um, her grandmother, or her mother, sorry, patient's grandmother had rheumatoid arthritis and lung disease, also uh, was on home oxygen and passed away in her 60s. And the maternal great-grandmother of the patient, again, had rheumatoid arthritis, lung disease, although I think she also had smoking exposure, so it was questionable as to what the origin was that of that. And she had also passed away many years ago in her 60s. And then there's many other members of the family on the maternal side that had rheumatoid arthritis. On our exam, he was tachycardic. Uh, he was also obese. Um, he had a large uh, right-sided periorbital mass with erythema, uh, tenderness to palpation. Unfortunately, that right eye had lost all vision. Um, and then he also had diffuse arthralgias without frank arthritis on exam, um, although some areas were more difficult to assess than others due to habitus and some chronic appearing skin changes. Here's a picture of the eye. It's pretty zoomed in just for patient privacy. Um, he had multiple previous uh, surgeries on this area, either from biopsy and then due to persistent exophthalmos, he had also had his lids sewn together um, to help with uh, um, exposure keratopathy. Um, and this was in our initial presentation with this patient, you can also see the erythema of the skin and the discharge from the eye. So historical records uh, were a little challenging to obtain, but the initial biopsy prior to any therapy being uh, administered showed lymphohistiocytic infiltrates, mostly CD4 T cells. There was some granuloma, histiocyte and eosinophils, um, no increase in IgG4 ratio. Um, and he had extensive laboratory workup as well that did have a mildly positive ANA, but otherwise a pretty extensive autoimmune uh, antibody workup that was negative. He had infectious workup that was negative as well as normal uh, complements and muscle enzymes. There was imaging reports uh, over the years as well. I pulled out a few uh, pertinent ones, including um, a CT angio that was negative, a CT chest that showed very small uh, lung nodules and two the bilateral lower lobes. Um, of his treatment history, it did indicate he had been on steroids continuously for five years. So two of those years, we'd consider high dose, um, which is concerning. Uh, and then he also did get evaluated at the Mayo Clinic as a second opinion, and we obtained those records as well. Uh, 
ophthalmology, infectious disease, and rheumatology all saw this patient and um, had different thoughts on him, but their workup uh, was not completed as the family did not return. Um, but essentially, there was no documented uveitis, like intraocular inflammation. There was no chronic disease or uh, findings on uh, fungal culture from the infectious disease uh, team. And the rheumatology team really favored more of a fibromyalgia than an arthritis on their exam and wanted genetic testing for this uh, unusual presentation. Our workup did show a mild transaminitis, some elevated muscle markers with aldolase and LDH, some mild inflammation, uh, a negative infectious testing. We also had a low IgM on our immunoglobulins. Our immune competence did have um, slightly elevated T cells uh, of the CD3 and CD4 variety, normal CD8 and NK cells, and then our CD19 positive B cells were undetectable, and that's in the setting of Q2 month rituximab uh, dosing. Um, we repeated some of our antibodies, which were negative, and we did decide to send a primary immunodeficiencies panel to Invite. That's the PID panel that I listed there. We did a little bit of testing for his chronic steroid exposure and then also repeat CT chest due to concern for the family history of lung disease and reported lung nodules on previous imaging, which fortunately was normal. We also got imaging, um, and here you can see that the right orbit is um, has extensive inflammation and enhancement, um, persistent exophthalmos. There's um, involvement of the extraocular muscles, stretching and compression of the optic nerve, and um, enhancement of the optic disc. Um, and it was thought to be most consistent with an inflammatory process, such as an orbital super pseudotumor. You can also see sinusitis here, and then um, the left eye, which is unaffected as far as his vision and external appearance, does have some enhancement uh, uh, behind the eye as well. Uh, intervally, he also got admitted uh, to the hospital for a large flank cellulitis requiring IV antibiotics. And then a couple of months later, he had a repeat cellulitis to his face on the side that does have the pseudotumor that uh, required Bactrim to resolve. So we were going to pause here and just see if the uh, collective as a whole wanted to think about what differential they would consider for this unusual patient. I know the answer. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as someone in the chat is asking, did the pseudotumor tumor respond to the antibiotics? Uh, no, no. Good, Good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and place in the chat if anybody has any ideas of um, differential diagnoses. Um, like uh, we have an Icaros vote in the chat, LRBA, a COPA syndrome. They're all good thoughts. Another vote for COPA. All right, um, looks good. We have a couple, oh, another vote for LRBA. Sounds good. All right, why don't we uh, go ahead and say what uh, what we were thinking of. Um, and another vote for Icaros, so right at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, I- wait wait, 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 wait a second, Rachel. So we have here, uh, we have Michael and we have Ryan, uh, Priyanka, that they say Icarus, and I will have to agree with that. So perhaps that kind of blows the whole story, but this is kind of very generic. So Michael, uh, Prayinka, can you expand a little bit of what you think about Icarus and which allelic variant of Icarus are you thinking about? Oh, now I make it complex. <laughs> we test you out a little bit beforehand. Because there's at least four diseases associated with Icarus, and they're almost completely different. So you are saying about diseases, they can go exactly in opposite direction. So Michael, you were so brave and you were the first one to <laughs> say Icarus. Come on, speak up. Which type of Icarus do you think this is uh, about? Priyanka, you can, uh, Priyanka, you can help him. <laughs> okay, Michael is not brave enough. Priyanka? <laughs> Rachel, it's all yours. <laughs> well, I will uh, lay out some of the phenotypes and maybe uh, that will spark some some more thought. Uh, when we think of uh, pediatric orbital pseudotumor, IgG4-related disease has to come to mind. At least 25% of our pediatric orbital pseudotumors can be explained by that. Um, of course, you have to think of... Um, 
uh, malignancy as well as other inflammatory states such as Castleman's. Um, we also thought about infection, although that had been somewhat ruled out. And I was definitely somewhat fixated on COPA syndrome with the history of lung disease in the family as well. I was very worried about that, um, but his CT was reassuring. And then we also had the uh, tincture of time that helped us with some of these diagnoses because um, we would have expected uh, malignancy five years later to be um, have progressed significantly or um, uh, we would have also expected some response to some of our therapies uh, depending on uh, these different differentials. So um, that was what we had started out with and our genetic testing did come back with a variant of uncertain significance in the IKZF1 gene. Um, and so thinking about that gene, uh, that is the Icarus gene that has been talked about. Uh, and this paper was an excellent paper um, that laid out the known in 2020, the known genotypes and phenotypes of uh, uh, Icarus. Um, so as a little bit of background, this is a DNA uh, binding domain that has four zinc fingers on the N terminal that bind the DNA. The C terminal has two more zinc fingers that form a dimerization domain. And those allow to um, allow the Icarus protein to dimerize either with itself or with other isoforms in its family, um, Helios, Aelos, or Eos. Um, and that would be a heterodimerization. Um, and it's a pretty complex protein that uh, just transcribes DNA and there's different um, alternative splicing as well. And so there's different isoforms of the Icarus protein. And it's a transcription factor, mostly for the hemopoietic and lymphocyte development. It also has a role as a tumor suppressor gene. Um, so the this paper got into the three big known phenotypes uh, described by um, previous uh, patients with uh, Icarus mutations. Haploinsufficient or HI is one of them, dominant negative and dimerization defect were the kind of three best understood. And haploinsufficient acted um, as more Icarus deficiency phenotype where you had um, reduction of either the amount of protein or its effectiveness. Dominant negative was a um, one described in a very small cohort of patients that presented very young and very severely. And though it was a single allele, uh, not like a homozygous change, um, it acted uh, dominantly uh, on the wild type allele. So it basically looked more like a homozygous um, presentation. It had a very severe phenotype. And then the dimerization defect was um, a mutation in a different in the uh, C terminal part of the Icarus gene. So it affected the ability to bind with a, another Icarus or a different uh, like ALOS protein, for example. And so that affected how it transcribed DNA in a different way and was a little more of a mild phenotype. Um, and this shows age of presentation, risk of bacterial infections versus autoimmunity, malignancy, um, their B cell numbers are in C, and then immune globulin levels. So there's some variation across uh, these different uh, presentations, um, but they're all more of a deficiency phenotype. Um, so for our patient, his variant was described as unknown. Uh, unknown significance. It wasn't one of the ones described previously uh, in the in the literature. We did some further workup on his immune system, and the ones in red were um, abnormal. His T cell immunophenotyping did show increase in CD8 positive memory T cells as well as CD4 memory T cells. Um, and then our T cell spectrotyping had an abnormal TCR uh, variable chain re re repertoire. We have been attempting to get B cell phenotyping, um, but our patient uh, has some social obstacles and we're planning on getting it uh, with his next visit. So this was exciting. This is a, a uh, paper put out. Um, fairly recently, although I guess it is coming up closer to a year now, that talked about a new Icarus phenotype that behaved more as a gain of function as opposed to a loss of one described previously. So this showed eight different families 
and, uh, or sorry, four families with eight individuals. Um, and you can see the relations in A. Um, and uh, it had a mutation in R183H, which is what our patient had on our uh, PID panel. And um, this uh, shows that there in E, you can see that there is a uh, computer modeling that shows there's probably a new uh, bond that's formed. Um, between uh, zinc fingers affecting the structure and function of the uh, icarose protein. This is a uh, phenotypic list of the eight patients and describes what was seen in them, their age of onset of symptoms, as well as diagnosis, their background, and then what was seen. Uh, three of these patients had Evans syndrome. That's what ES stands for in the autoimmunity column, which was interesting. There was other types of um, autoimmunity, such as celiac type 1 diabetes, autoimmune hepatitis, um, colitis, alopecia, vitiligo, and um, then there's also patients with ATP and allergy, uh, four of the eight. There was patients with lymphadenopathy and plasma cell proliferation, four of the eight again, and then some other manifestations such as recurrent infections. And then the farthest right column, you can see what they had been treated with, um, including rituximab, sirolimus steroids, uh, one patient with a JAK inhibitor um, and a bone marrow transplant, and then IVIG. Uh, the paper went into some more um, laboratory uh, testing and studies that they did, and I'll just point out some of the highlights in D. Um, well, uh, just so you know what these uh, different mutations that they're comparing, wild type is uh, the normal gross gene, R183H is this gain-of-function gene that um, we was, have identified in our patient, N159S is a um, dominant negative uh, uh, gene uh, mutation, and then R162Q is one of the haploinsufficient uh, mutations described. And uh, in D, you can see our patient um, had enhanced DNA binding with his uh, altered uh, Icaros protein compared to wild type in gray, and it was opposite of what was seen in the dominant negative and haploinsufficient patients. Uh, mutation. And then it also altered the um, uh, promoter activation uh, that was seen, and it was opposite of those with the haploinsufficient insufficient and dominant negative. You can see that in E, where um, the red columns are uh, the mutation described in our patient with um, repression of a couple of promoters and uh, hyperactivation of a different one, which was opposite of effect of what was seen with the uh, Icaros deficiency phenotypes. Um, the Icarus deficiency phenotypes also had uh, typically low B cells, B cell arrest, and reduced memory T cells, impaired differentiation of those cells, whereas uh, these gain of function patients uh, in lab modeling and um, in the blood samples of the patients had more um, increased B cells, as well as um, T cells that were skewed towards uh, differentiated memory phenotypes. And that was due to a uh, reduced production of interleukin-2 and interferon gamma inside the cells. Um, and so that aberrant cytokine uh, production led to their uh, terminal differentiation. Um, and that's seen again in this imaging um, where they showed how uh, the in B, you can see the um, amount of IL-2 positive cells as well as uh, interferon gamma. And then uh, they also cultured these cells with lenalidomide, which uh, decreases IRF4 expression um, to inhibit plasma cell differentiation, which is it's also known to degrade uh, the Icarus protein and the Icarus uh, helos heterodimer. Um, and that was seen to reverse uh, the effects uh, seen by the mutation. I won't get into this too much just because I want to not run out of time, but four of the eight patients did have abnormal plasma cell prol proliferation and accumulation in the tissues. Um, and that's important when thinking about our patients as well. Um, so when we think about him, we know that he has autoimmunity lymphoproliferation in the form of a chronic uh, periorbital mass. 
He does have allergy and hives somewhat frequently uh, that I didn't get into. He's had multiple serious bacterial infections, some requiring hospitalization or debridement. And then his uh, family has a strong history of autoimmunity. Um, so we do feel that his presentation can be explained by his genetic testing that found this gain of function mutation in his Icarus gene, leading to a uh, broad immune dysregulation. Um, just a little bit of a picture to help you remember that the phenotypic domains of Icarus mutations are pretty broad and can lead to autoimmunity, A to B, uh, lymphoproliferation, as well as immunodeficiency. The current treatment that we have our patient on, he failed many multiple immunosuppressives and often in combination. We started Sirolimus based on the paper that I highlighted prior with our trough goal of 8 to 12. It's still early. We haven't seen a dramatic infect, uh, effect, although uh, it's been challenging to get him into our uh, trough goal. Um, Another consideration is lenalidomide, which uh, showed some effectiveness in lab and makes sense from a, uh, a mechanism. However, it's not approved in pediatrics. Um, and we've also had him evaluated by our bone marrow transplant team in oculoplastics, and they have determined he is a candidate for a bone marrow transplant, and family is very interested in this. Um, and they had wanted surgery for eye removal due to its... Um, propensity for uh, infections and it's irritating to him and his lost vision, but surgery would be very uh, extensive and involve a free flap in their um, nervous death. <clears throat> so in summary, we can have uh, B cell arrest of development as well as um, hypogam, uh, autobody, antibody production, uh, recurrent infections, um, T cell effects as well, including a decreased repertoire. There can be effects on cancer regulation, propensity for uh, uh, leukemia or other cancers, proliferative disease, um, uh, autoimmunity and allergy, and other lineages can be affected too. Um, and just so y'all know, Icaros is the uh, Greek uh, figure in mythology that uh, had wings made of like feathers, sticks, and beeswax. And he was warned not to fly too close to the sun or he'd melt his wings and, and he did. Um, he fell to his death. Um, so these are some of the references that I used. And I wanted to thank um, my mentors on this case, as well as our topic expert, Dr. Rosenzweig. Thank you so much. And we wanted to ask the group thoughts on other workup for this patient or treatments that you thought might be beneficial for him. Yeah, we'll see. We'll throw it back to Sergio and see if he has any comments on um, just as we were talking about with the first case. Uh, we have, you know, very few numbers of patients to begin with, and we're still trying to look to kind of expand and learn more about the phenotype and the best treatment strategies. If you could give us any pearls on um, treatment response approaches and your thoughts, maybe on bone marrow transplant, for example, in this um, uh, for this uh, disorder. So Rachel, thank you for the presentation. It was way better than I could have done it. So you know the topic way better than I. But let me tell you what I learned from this patient and what I learned from the patient that Conetti presented. So genetic testing, it's to be used. So go for genetic testing because it's gonna give you the answer. Actually, if we go to this particular patient, I remember when somebody sent me an email and said, oh, we have this patient with this phenotype and has this mutation. Uh, yes, it was published last week. So it was already there. So, but what I mean is use the genetic testing because it's usually useful. Caveats. So in Bitai, for example, they didn't have uh, Icarus included in their panel until one year ago because it was too complex. So Icarus is very similar to Aeolus, Helios, Pegasus, and Eos. So for those guys, it was too much work to discriminate within, between one and the other. So panels are fantastic as long as they give you the answer. If they don't give you the answer, they mean almost nothing. So they rule out, but if the gene is not included, so then you are not going to find it. So second, Michael and Priyanka, you are absolutely right because the guys were so smart, let's say Icarus, because Icarus can fit any single fucking phenotype. Because so Rachel showed you that the guys can have immunodeficiency or no immunodeficiency. They can increase allergy or protect us from allergy. They can have whatever you want. So always use Icarus as your differential. Don't go to specifics because then you get into problems. 
But if you say Icarus, as Michael said and Priyanka said, you will be always covered. Uh, you will look so smart using Greek mythology in order to uh, you know, claim names because Icarus can cover every single clinical phenotype. So we have patients with dominant negative that they have zero B cells, complete a gum, and they are protected towards allergies and autoimmunity. And then you have the gain of functions that they have, B cell proliferation, autoimmunity, immune dysregulation, they have everything. They have a mutation in the same gene and sometimes just one amino acid apart. So use Icarus because you're gonna, you're gonna always be right. Don't go to specifics because then you can get confused. So other thing that we learned from this case. So other interesting thing, the first eight patients that we reported, we said that they have, can you go back like 10 slides where you have the, all the circles, Rachel, go back, back the small circles upper right. More, 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 more. One more, there, stop there. You see there, oh, oh, there, stop there. You see upper right where it says leukemia lymphoma in the R183HC0. We are wrong by probably 50% now. So those were the first eight patients. They didn't have lymphoma leukemia. Now that we know more than 20 patients, we know that almost half of them, they have lymphoma leukemia, plus minus myeloma, multiple myeloma. So in the first eight, we didn't find it, but now that we have collected more patients, we do know that those patients, they do have malignancy. So that's it was, it didn't surprise me that much, the lymphohistocytic proliferation that your patient has, because now we know what we didn't know at the time of publication, another analogy with the CASPAI 10 patient that Conetti defended before. So you can be so wrong when you're just looking for eight patients, but then, that's where we have to collect more and learn more. Lymphoma, leukemia, multiple myeloma is part of the disease in these patients. Lymphoproliferation and tumors are part of the disease in these patients. So this is another lesson learned. Papers are fantastic for the ego, but then we have to see more patients in order to really know whatever is happening to our patients. Now we can go to the last slide. So another thing, these papers said, oh, lenanidomide is gonna be, you know, cure everything. We try, it doesn't work. Clinically, eh. it works fantastically theoretically because lenalinomide binds to cerebellum and promotes the degradation of Icarus and Iolos. So say if I have a gain on function mutation, I promote the degradation by ubiquitination and then problem is solved. It works in the lab. When you give it to the patient, eh, not always work. But transplant, I can tell you because we have already two patients that have been transplanted, it works. So transplant correct Icarus mutation, despite of regardless the allelic variant that they have. Haploid insufficiency, dominant negative, demyelination defective, and gain of function could be corrected by bone marrow transplant. So in this case, I think that bone marrow transplant is a good option because this guy is prone to all the other diseases that they have been described and the ones that are yet to be described associated with Icarus gain of function. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple comments in the chat. Um, can we predict the impact of the IKZF1 missense mutations based on the domain involved? Great question, absolutely wrong. So even, so the same amino acid, so we have amino acids that they're in position 183, position 184, completely different clinical phenotype. 184, one amino acid, 184 to another amino acid, completely different clinical phenotype too. So this is great for me because Icarus has more than 500 amino acids and you know there are 20 amino acids possible per position. So there's probably, you know what, 20 times 500, there's like 10,000 different diseases that we can explore. So no, you cannot predict unless it has been tested. Mm -hmm. So no, there's no prediction. So I can tell you that N159S is a dominant negative, N159K, is an absolutely happy insufficiency defect. So you cannot predict the same position, different amino acidic change, completely different clinical phenotype. They're, they're impressed with your mental math and uh, they think you should have called the gene chimera. Um, yeah. Do you think that uh, thalidomide derivatives may work better for the gain of function phenotype with increased protein levels? So, so it works in the lab, as I said before, when we tried in our patients, it didn't work. So, okay, it was not a clinical trial. It was a single patient exception because it's an FDA approved drug. 
So it was given to one patient and it didn't work. So the patient had to go to transplant. Mm -hmm. So might work or a clinical trial has to be done, but in an experience of N of one, didn't work. So I would say, because it's a drug that is FDA approved and is safe enough, I might try it, but I will not, I will not hold my breath for that to cure the disease. Right. Yeah, and we have another uh, agreement with um, uh, transplant to, to save the kiddo's other eye. Um, and just one last comment, because we're running low on time. What, what do you think is actually happening with the eye? Immune cell overgrowth, general inflammatory reactions, reaction, malignancy? So I think that it's lymphoproliferation, benign, benign in terms that it's not cancer, but it could be cancer. At this point, it's semi-irrelevant because of the location and the damage that it's producing. If it's cancer, it's benign lymphoproliferation, is leaving this, this kid blind. So I guess that is bad because of the rate of proliferation and the site. So it has to be treated very aggressively. I do think that this patient might benefit from the immunosuppression associated to BMT plus BMT because it's gonna prevent the guy for all the other. So for example, patients that have been transplanted with again function, anaphylaxis disappeared. Uh, cancers disappeared, disappeared in terms of they did not happen again. So I guess that for those patients, I will strongly suggest, suggest bone marrow transplant for those that they have a suitable donor. Great, thank you. All right, um, well, I wanna thank um, Rachel and Sergio for this great case and our presenters, Matthew and uh, Kennedy Rao and our moderator, Melissa, for our first case. Um, two great um, present presentations tonight. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And if you have any interesting cases that come up, that you'd like to pre present or recommend, I put the email here in the chat. Um, oops, um, and uh, thank you, Natty, for putting it to everyone. Um, info at clinicalimmunologysociety.org for interesting cases uh, that you would like to recommend. So hopefully we'll all see you all next month for our next webinar um, and um, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you for participating.